Sorry, Councillor Sally, I think you're on mute. Sorry. There we go. It didn't take long to have to say that, did it? <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Wandsworth COVID-19 vaccine information event. This is our first borough-wide vaccine information event hosted by the Council and supported by our NHS colleagues. There will be further events to follow, which I will tell you about at the end. I'm Councillor Claire Salia. I'm the portfolio holder for adult health and social care. Tonight's about sharing information so each of us can make our own informed decision about whether or not we take the COVID vaccine. The people you'll meet this evening are some of our senior officers working on health in Wandsworth. These people know us in our communities and I think it's really important that you meet the decision makers in our borough. These are the people who are managing the local messaging that we see around health. They manage the GPs and the health services that we receive in the community and they're monitoring our local health needs to make sure that you get the services you need to keep you and your families well. This evening they're going to talk to you about what they know about the vaccine and address some of the concerns that you've raised about how the vaccine has been developed, how it's administered and how it will affect us as individuals. I'm so pleased that so many of our community are joining us tonight and that so many of you have sent in your questions in advance and hopefully we're going to get to hear the answers to, to a lot of them this evening. We're going to hear from Mr Shannon Cotillo, who is our Director of Public Health based in Wandsworth Council. We're also going to hear from Dr Nicola Jones, who's the lead GP for Wandsworth and is also the Vice Chair of the Clinical Commissioning Board here in Wandsworth. Um, finally, we'll be joined by Dr Kieran Ernie, who is a GP at the Putney Mead practice. Dr Ernie is currently running a surgery and is going to be joining us from that slightly later on. He's going to talk to us about what it's like to receive the vaccine, what kind of concerns and issues he's hearing from people as a GP. And I'm then going to have a chance to put our questions to these health professionals. Some of um, you have submitted these, as I said already, some of you will be submitting them in the chat function as the meeting progresses. We hope that the evening will address your concerns and it will allow you to get to know some of the people who are taking a lead in local health provision. Um, I'd also like to say that we will get back to you with answers to the questions in the chat that aren't covered this evening if we do run out of time. So before we start, I just want to cover off a few housekeeping issues. This is a Teams live event, so it might work a little differently from normal Teams or Zoom events that you're used to. We can't see you, but we can see how many people are with us. And as I said, we'll be able to see the Q&A function, but we won't be responding to it directly this evening. You're not able to put your hand up at this event, but the council team in the background will be monitoring all of the questions and answers that you hand in. We're really keen to hear concerns and questions, but if you've got any good news stories that you want to share about the vaccine as well, you can do that through this button and we'll be able to keep in touch with you after the event's finished. We're going to have the answers to all the questions that we are put tonight, including the ones that we answer in person, onto an FAQ section on the council's website. And the details of this will follow after the call's finished. I ask that you're courteous and that you're patient when you submit your questions. Our staff want to make sure that you get the right information and the right answers, so they might not be able to give you an answer straight away this evening. If you don't see your question published on the screen, it doesn't mean that we haven't received it. It means that it's still going through the moderating function. If you find it useful this evening and you'd like to use closed captions, you can um, turn these on on the screen. If you go to the top right hand corner, the top three dots of your screen there sh and click on it, there should be a sign that says turn on closed captions if you click there. It is also available in selected languages. Later on, um, colleagues are going to share a quiz with you as well as asking you what you thought about this event. So please keep an eye out for the information coming up to the right of your screen and please do participate in it because it will help us improve the event and make any changes that we need so that future events are really meeting your needs and answering your questions in the way that you like. Thank you for joining us this evening. I really hope that you find the event useful. It is being recorded and it will be available to watch back within a few days on the Council website along with that FAQ section. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker this evening, who's Mr Shannon Cotillo, the Director of Public Health at Wandsworth Council, and he's going to be able to talk us through the development of the vaccine. Mr Cotillo. Thank you, uh, Councillor Salia, and uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I just want to really thank you for giving up your time this evening to come and talk about a really important issue, which is the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and before I do, I just want to uh, thank my colleagues uh, in the public health 
division who've produced all the materials that I will share with you this evening. Um, and also they've been working really hard uh, in terms of ensuring that we try and address any questions that people might have. I also want to thank colleagues in the community and partnerships team and communications team who've made this event possible. So um, in my session, I really want to uh, talk about the vaccines and how they work. I intend to cover a little bit around uh, questions that people might have in terms of, well, why have they been developed so quickly? Uh, and I'll also talk about their safety, their effectiveness, uh, as well as who's getting the vaccines first and some of the reasoning behind some of that. I also start to address some of the questions that we've been frequently asked throughout the course of uh, several engagement events we've had around the COVID-19 vaccine. And then I'll pass over to uh, Dr. Nicola Jones and Dr. Kieran Ernie. So until now, vaccines are probably something that most people don't really need to think about after childhood, you know, when you've had your routine childhood immunizations, or perhaps until you need to go on holiday to some kind of destination that requires for you to have specific vaccines. But actually in public health, we think about vaccines all the time and they've never stopped being important. And obviously now we're at this pivotal moment where we're talking about vaccines uh, once again. Now, the UK has one of the best immunization programs globally, and actually we're always at the forefront of rolling out new vaccines. And next to clean water, vaccinations are the most important intervention in terms of uh, promoting life and preventing disease. Um, you know, when, in, in, when you compare to, to any of the other interventions that, uh, that we have around. So actually vaccines are really important and diseases that, you know, some of our grandparents uh, may have uh, used, may, may have feared in the past are probably diseases which uh, now are very rare in the UK. And, you know, in some instances, for example, like polio, they're consigned to the past entirely and people don't have to think about them. And obviously this is all thanks to vaccines. Now, as we know from the pandemic, there are many different ways of trying to stay safe and get protection against an infectious disease, but vaccination is actually the safest way of doing that. Because once you've been vaccinated, your body then learns to recognize the virus, and it means that if you encounter it later on, your body is really primed to challenge that, uh, that virus when it encounters it. And it should, uh, the vaccine should help you develop a level of protection, which we sometimes call immunity against that particular disease. Now, some people might ask, you know, whether it's better to just acquire infection uh, and, and uh, naturally as, as a way of protecting yourself. But actually the answer to that is no. The vaccine is the safest way because if you become infected, then you have a period where you're potentially infectious to other people. And for some of those people, the virus could have quite serious implications. And also that means you become part of the problem in terms of spreading the vaccine to loved ones or within communities where you live. So the vaccine is the safest way to uh, protect yourself because it actually can't give you the infection and it allows you to build up your immunity and build up your protection in a controlled way without passing the disease on to others. So what I have in front of you is a slide that just uh, tries to illustrate um, the problem of trying to stop a disease spreading in a population where not a lot of people have got protection or not a lot of people have had the vaccine. And you can see quite clearly that if you're in a community or a population where very few people have had the vaccine and are not protected, firstly, the virus can travel very rapidly uh, within that particular community to infect people and also the potential for it to cause serious illness and potentially death is quite vast because you've got people who are completely not protected. But however, if you start to have uh, people being protected in a community and some of those people or a lot of them have had the vaccine, then quite clearly that limits the opportunities for the virus to spread within that community and cause lots of potential damage. 
So currently, there's still a lot of research that's taking place to see whether the current COVID vaccines provide this type of uh, protection and just how many people need to have the vaccine in order to uh, protect the whole community or the whole population. But the early signs are really encouraging and they're promising and they're showing a reduction in disease transmission for the COVID-19 vaccine. And actually, there is a study called SIREN uh, conducted by Public Health England, which just recently published uh, some results around this on the .gov website. A lot of people are curious about what's in the vaccine. Um, actually, you'd be surprised to know that one of the main ingredients or the largest component of vaccines is water. But of course, there are other ingredients which are also really important. And the most important ingredient in the vaccine is the active ingredient. The active ingredient is usually a very small amount of either a harmless form of the virus that you're immunizing against uh, or, or some other fragments. And, and the role of the active ingredient is actually to deliver antigens or foreign bodies, if you like, to your immune system. And that helps your body to recognize that, you know, there's something foreign and it primes your body to generate a response to, 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 to that particle or to the virus. So vaccines for COVID-19 introduce antigens from the virus to your body in different ways. And I'll come on to that. Now, some vaccines have what is called an adjuvant. And this is a substance that helps to create a stronger immune response to the vaccine. Adjuvants usually pose no significant threat or risk to health, and they're only usually used in small quantities. Now, it's important to note that the three vaccines that we currently have licensed for use uh, in the UK against COVID-19 do not actually contain any of these adjuvants. And then we've also got preservatives or stabilizers, and the role of these is just to maintain the vaccine quality and make sure that throughout the whole production line until that vaccine is delivered to an individual who needs it, the vaccine uh, is preserved in terms of its integrity and can be safely stored and also prevents uh, the vaccine from becoming contaminated by other things. There will also be some very, very minuscule uh, traces of other substances that have been used in producing the vaccine. And these will be so in such small quantities that they're usually measured in parts per million or parts per billion. And then finally, of course, as I mentioned, water is the largest and the main ingredient. Now, it's important to recognize that every vaccine will be made up of slightly different ingredients depending on how the vaccine has been developed. But I think the important points for us to note are that there are no animal products that have been used in the manufacture of the current vaccines that have been approved for use in the United Kingdom. And currently, the approved vaccines for COVID-19 do not contain the virus itself and they cannot make you sick from uh, COVID, uh, from, from COVID disease. And also, I think just for reassurance, a full list of the ingredients for each of the vaccines that have been licensed in the UK is available on the .gov website. And obviously the people who are trained to deliver the vaccine to you will be aware of uh, the ingredients and they'll have had very specific training for administering each of these vaccines. So as I said, uh, we've got three vaccines which are currently approved for use in the UK. Two of them are mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines, and one is called a viral vector vaccine, and I'll explain that. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are the mRNA vaccines, whilst the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is the viral vector vaccine. Now, messenger mRNA or mRNA is just a single strand of genetic material that corresponds to a part of the gene sequence in the virus. And the intention is for your body to, to be able to recognize that through the vaccine so that it can be ready to protect you from, uh, from the actual virus. So as I mentioned, vaccines deliver a component called an antigen or a foreign body uh, in, into your body to help um, to, 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 to activate your, your immune response. 
and uh, there are different types of vaccines that will be made up of either inactivated or weakened or modified virus or some kind of genetic uh, material which will prime your immune system. The key message uh, to take home is that messenger RNA vaccines do not alter your DNA and in fact uh, the mRNA that is delivered into your body by the vaccine cannot enter the part of your cells where your DNA is contained and therefore they cannot alter it and actually that small fragment of mRNA quickly degrades uh, within a matter of hours uh, after the vaccine has been delivered into your body so it does not interfere with your DNA. Now some people will be asking okay is this new technology how do we know it's safe? <laughs> well actually this technology seems like it's new technology but it's built on the back of many years of research and mRNA vaccines uh, for have been around for example for some cancers and rabies and they've been uh, developed through clinical trials and used in humans uh, safely for many years with promising results and no major safety, safety concerns arising. The Medicines Health Regulatory Authority, which is the body in the UK that's responsible for licensing the vaccines, has thoroughly assessed all the clinical data from all the trials that have taken place around the COVID vaccines and they have deemed that these vaccines are all very safe and very effective um, in, in protecting people and preventing severe disease or reducing the risk of death. And actually a lot of the clinical uh, trial data that came from these, these studies and the research used to uh, produce the vaccines have all been published um, in peer-reviewed medical journals which are available uh, to, to, to members of the public and others to have a look at. Next slide please, thank you. Oh sorry, you are on the right slide. So the other type of vaccine is what is called a viral vector vaccine and what this uh, vaccine does is it relies on using other uh, viruses which are safer for humans to transport that genetic code that I talked about which codes for the antigen and so it relies on these safer viruses to transport that genetic uh, information into the body and in the case of COVID-19 um, what it's transferring is a code for the spike proteins which are found on the surface of the virus and transports those into your body so that when your body does actually encounter the virus then it recognizes those spike proteins and again your immune system should be primed to, to respond rapidly to that vaccine. Now again it's also important to stress that viral vector vaccines are not new and actually they've been used in the past uh, for example uh, for preventing Ebola and actually they've been though they were developed after many years again of clinical trials. So people will be asking so uh, if it usually takes many years of clinical trials to develop vaccines then uh, how come the COVID vaccines have been developed in a rapidly short space of time? And that's a really important question. Now it does normally take several years to develop a vaccine, but in this instance scientists have had to collaborate in a very different way to what they would usually do and very rapidly in order for them to achieve the same amount of progress just within a matter of a few months um, than, they, than they would have normally done in order for them to produce vaccines that are safe and that are effective and, and also ensuring that those vaccines will be able to, uh, to, to be delivered to people as quickly as possible. Although clinical trials have been carried more rapidly, actually the process um, has not been compromised in any way because some of the steps that would usually happen one after the other, therefore leading to several years, uh, of clinical trials and research before vaccines can be uh, can be uh, administered more widely. Some of those steps have actually been taken with an overlap or a little bit in parallel and that's part of the reason why we've managed to get these vaccines from laboratory and actually uh, into the population uh, in a short space of time. 
So although uh, these steps have happened uh, quite quickly, obviously the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority and other research bodies have ensured that none of the uh, safety steps have been compromised in any way. So the other important points around the rapid um, development of the vaccines include uh, contributions from other sectors. So for example, um, everybody has been willing to work together more collaboratively than they normally would. Governments have removed some of the financial obstacles and barriers that would prevent some of the research bodies and manufacturers from being able to develop products so rapidly. And also large scale manufacturers have exposed themselves and put themselves at risk because once they started to see the early signs that the vaccines were going to be effective, then they set up you know, all their machinery to make sure that they would be able to deliver large quantities of the vaccines as soon as they uh, had the regulatory approval. And finally, of course, we can't forget the tens of thousands of people across the world who, as soon as they were aware that vaccine trials were happening for COVID, actually put themselves forward and put themselves on the line uh, to be tested as part of the clinical trials so that the vaccine could uh, quite quickly be made available and the trials were not hampered or delayed by the need to find volunteers. Now, uh, in terms of the priority groups and who gets the vaccine first, in the United Kingdom, we've got what is called the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunizations. And this is the group that looks at the evidence base in terms of how the vaccines work to protect people and then come up with recommendations for the government in terms of the people that uh, should get the vaccine first uh, because of the ability to, to, to benefit uh, from the vaccine. So the JCVI has looked at all the vaccines and they've come up with, um, with priority groups for people to be targeted against the vaccine. So I think a lot of you will know some of this already in terms of some of the first groups to, to get the vaccine were people who are resident in care homes, the staff working with them and their carers. And then uh, we followed a, a progression that was based on on, on age because uh, everything that we've looked at so far in terms of the impacts of COVID-19 have shown us that age is the single biggest risk factor for people becoming unwell, ending up in hospital and potentially dying. So actually what that uh, is, what the, what the um, priority groups reflect is that prioritization which is based on the risk factor associated with age. And I think uh, Dr. Jones will probably cover some of this uh, as well in terms of the priority groups when uh, when we come to to her presentation. So I'd just like to uh, quickly address some of the common questions that we've been asked uh, by by other people across the boroughs. And the first question is, can I get COVID-19 from the vaccine? So as I've mentioned, no, you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccination. Uh, it is possible for some people that they might have caught COVID before they get the vaccination and so they might then uh, develop some symptoms which, uh, which are similar to those that you might have with the COVID-19 vaccine, but actually the vaccine in itself, it cannot give you COVID-19. Some people have asked us, well, if I've already had COVID-19, why do I need the vaccine? Well, the answer to this is that it's hoped that vaccines for COVID-19 will provide protective immunity that is long lasting and potentially longer lasting than the immunity that you might get from just acquiring the disease uh, naturally. And if you remember, we've also said that getting the vaccine is the safest way of protecting yourself against the virus because you don't know at the point where you get the infection whether you're going to uh, have particularly nasty disease uh, or end up with some very serious side effects. So if even if people have already had COVID, they should still get the vaccine in order to provide them more effective and longer lasting immunity from the disease. And then uh, the last question is, 
people have been asking after I've had my COVID-19 vaccination, can I still pass the virus on to other people? So there's uh, continued monitoring is happening in terms of the clinical trial. So even though people have started to get the vaccine in large numbers, researchers and scientists are still looking at the ability of the vaccine to try and stop people catching and passing on the virus. So it's really important that even after people have had their uh, COVID vaccine, they firstly still continue to get the second dose if it's a two dose vaccine and also continue to follow all the national restrictions and all the public health rules in order to protect themselves and to protect people around them. And then the final uh, sort of question um, is, is it better to get COVID-19 naturally? So I think we've we've answered this and the answer is no, it's not a good idea. Uh, you still pose a risk to people around you when you catch the disease because you could still pass it on and it could have some nasty consequences. Some people have asked after COVID-19 vaccination, Sorry, I think I've got a bit of a duplication in my uh, in, in in my slides. So I think what what I'll do now is um, I'll probably go on to to my last slide, which is just around uh, after the event. You've obviously heard that uh, we've got uh, an evaluation, a feedback form, and it's really important for us to get that feedback from you in terms of how useful uh, the event has been and how well we've addressed some of the issues and concerns. So please do go on to the council website. The link will be provided to you so you can provide that feedback. And just finally, before I close, I just also wanted to introduce uh, one of the members of our public health division, and her name is Asmat Nisa. Um, Asmat is one of the public health consultants um, in Wandsworth Council who has really been behind our efforts to fight the uh, COVID response. And I just wanted to uh, introduce Asmat as somebody that you might encounter or someone that you might uh, have some liaison with if there are any further issues or, or questions where you need some public health input. Uh, Asmat, I don't know if you just want to say hello to everyone. Um. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Shannon. Um, yes, I'm delighted to be supporting Shannon um, in the COVID-19 response um, by the council. I joined the council around October 2020 and um, delighted to respond to to any queries that come through our mailbox and we continue to um, we continue to put efforts in through the public health team and the response team um, with a view to um, supporting colleagues and also members of the public in understanding better some of the issues around um, COVID-19. So um, thank you Shannon. Thank you. I'll hand back to, to the chair now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katia, and thank you, Dr. Nisa, as well, for introducing yourself. On our public health team, we're always available um, to answer any extra questions that you might have. Thank you very much for that, both. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Nicola Jones, who is the GP primary care lead in Wandsworth, um, and she's going to take you through some of the COVID-19 vaccine information. Dr. Jones. Thank you, uh, Councillor Slea. Um, evening, everybody. Um, I'm Nicola Jones um, and I'm a GP um, and I've been working in Wandsworth for 26 years. Um, so and as you can see from that title slide, I do a few other things as well when I'm not seeing my patients. So um, as Claire said, I'm the lead GP for Wandsworth, um, but I'm also responsible for the organisation of general practice across South West London. Um, and when the vaccine programme came along with much of it being delivered through GP practices, I became responsible for the primary care element of that too. But a lot of my time at the moment is taken with running the vaccine clinic at my practice, where three practices have come together to vaccinate their patients. So I've also got um, you know, real life, current experience of how all this is going. Um, next slide, please. 
And so although we're still really only in the middle of the story, um, the vaccination programme has been already an extraordinary success. Um, it mobilised really quickly and um, some uh, sites only had a couple of weeks notice of really you know getting going and knowing their vaccine was being delivered and they set it up from scratch and people have been working really hard for three months now to make it success. It's the largest vaccination program in history um, and most of us feel somewhat exhausted but very proud of what's being achieved so I want to say thank you to um, all of my NHS colleagues and our partners in the local authority and in public health particularly um, for the, um, the support and, and the joint effort that we've all made. Um, so over 70% of vaccines have been delivered at primary care sites by your local GPs, by their practice staff and by teams of volunteers. And we've had fantastic input from volunteers. Um, we've now offered a vaccine to all people over the age of 70 and frontline health and care staff. So we've urged everybody over 70 who hasn't yet had an invitation for a vaccine to book their jab either through the National Booking Service, um, which you can um, get to online or by calling 119, um, or to call their GP practice. So at this stage, um, your GP would um, want to hear from you if you are over the age of 70 and you haven't yet had the offer of a, a vaccine or if indeed you declined it initially but have changed your mind, please do contact your uh, practice or the national booking line. So the first group of people vaccinated were the people who are the most at risk from having a serious illness if they contact um, contract COVID. So that meant that people over the age of 70 or those in the clinically extremely vulnerable group were the first to be offered vaccine vaccine and that clinically extremely vulnerable group are the people who were shielding. And we're now inviting people who are over 65 um, or adults under 65 where they've got a condition, a health condition that might put them at higher risk of having a serious illness. Um, and these groups have been agreed nationally um, as advised by a committee known as the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunisations, which is the committee that has advised and immunisations for many years. It wasn't set up specifically for COVID, so it was well equipped to deal with the kind of decisions that it's had to do. Next slide, please. So we're delivering the vaccine from seven general practice led sites in Wandsworth. And in recent weeks, um, there have been two pharmacy sites opened too. And there are plans for two mass vaccination sites as well in Wandsworth. Um, because as we start to vaccinate people in even larger numbers, this is going to be needed. Um, our GPs, although doing much of the organisation and delivery of this right now, need to be able to deal with people who need them for other health issues. And we'd want people to be able to access the vaccine in a place that suits them. So it's opening up into other venues, which I think will be really helpful in making sure people can get the vaccine. Um, next slide, please. So people who are known to their GP to have an underlying condition are going to be invited to their GP vaccine site. Um, and anyone in those groups now can also book through the national booking system. You see the link there um, and um, it's easy to find if you are uh, Googling it. Just put in um, COVID vaccine and booking and up it comes. So we're not encouraging other people at the moment to come forward and that's because we're still trying to get the vaccine to the people who are at the greatest risk um, and there's lots of interest and lots of phone calls to GP practices so we do want to make sure that the people who need to can get through so if you're not then um, it's not your turn yet so um, please don't come forward but if you think you've been missed then please do. Um, but we want to encourage anybody who isn't registered with the GP practice to take this opportunity to do that because it may be that you're at high risk and that you would be offered the vaccine and in addition there are obviously other healthcare services that you might be able to access and people aren't registered with the GP practice for all sorts of reasons um, but it is something to consider at this point in time so I'd really encourage people to do that. You don't need, you don't need proof of address or immigration status, you just need to go to your your um, GP practice and you can often do it online. Uh, next slide please. So in the last week or so um, more people across the country are being asked to shield 
against coronavirus. Um, so people have now been identified as clinically extremely vulnerable by um, the use of a, a different way of assessing them. So not just because of the health conditions they've got, but taking account other risk factors, um, including their ethnicity, their um, where they live, their um, uh, likelihood of being living in deprived circumstances, um, their body mass index, which is um, an assessment of your um, your weight versus your height and whether you're overweight or obese. So people in those groups and others um, have now been added to the group of people who are being recommended to shield and the shielding advice is until the 31st of March. Those people should already have got a letter. Um, so I know many of my patients have, have um, been contacting us to say that they've now got a letter, but we already knew in the GP practice because we were notified of it too. And um, people who were already shielding, of course, they need to continue to shield until 31st of March as well. Next slide, please. So we want to, um, oh, one forward again. We want to make sure that um, everybody can get a vaccine um, if they want one, um, but we're focusing especially on those from um, communities experiencing inequalities, um, and especially where we know they're going to be more barriers to uptake. And as you can see from that map, um, these are some particular areas of concern in Wandsworth. So the deep blue um, areas, so over there in Roehampton, Putney Vale, down in Tooting and Furzdown, um, and in the Battersea area as well. Um, so those are particular areas of concern and uh, within those areas especially we want to ensure that people who are older who come from black and other high risk ethnicity backgrounds people who live in deprived areas and also people living with a learning disability um, we want to make sure people have good access to information and to the vaccine um, and, and at this early stage in the program what we do know is that white communities are overrepresented and black communities underrepresented in those who have been vaccinated. So black residents make up 13.7% of the population in Wandsworth, but only 7.5% of those who um, have accepted an offer of the vaccine within the groups that we're um, currently inviting. So um, there's a much higher proportion of people coming forward from white um, and of Asian ethnicity. Um, so this is of real concern. Um, we want to make sure that people have um, the right opportunities. Next slide, please. So we're working in partnership with clinicians and local leaders to offer accurate and trustworthy, accessible information so that people can feel really confident in coming forward to getting the vaccine and so that they can protect themselves and their health. Next slide. Some of the approaches have been focused on families, um, some on tackling digital exclusion, some important work going on with health and care professionals as well, because um, if we protect those working on the front line, then we think we're protecting everybody. So I think that's been a really important approach. And next slide. There've been um, 33 up to now community engagement events to date. Um, and reaching over 1,300 Wandsworth residents, uh, including people from communities which are seldom heard. Um, and we're seeing a, a correlation between the higher levels of deprivation and lower levels of uptake um, at this stage in the programme. So, and that is consistent with other vaccination programmes. So this is worthwhile work to be doing, not just for this immunisation programme, but for other purposes in health as well, um, to make sure that people can get access to the healthcare we need. You know, this engagement is really critical in ensuring that not only people have the right have the access to the right information but we want to hear what people's concerns are we can understand them and and therefore make sure that we can address them next slide please so generally people have understandable questions about the program you know given the speed of vaccine development and the rollout and a lot of the things that, that shannon was saying are because of what we've heard people asking about um, but there have been some deeper concerns reflecting people's personal experience um, and also levels of trust in statutory organisations and you know people people like me who are here and saying oh everybody should get the vaccine. Um, so it, it's really important that we really understand that and so these kind of um, events are really important and your questions that you're putting in the um, in the question and answer are, are really important for us to take forward this work so and um, keep those coming. Next slide, please. So um, 
it's, it is really clear that, um, you know, there's lots of national and regional work being published um, because of uncertainty about the up uptake. And we've been trying to explore what those factors are. And they're really multiple and complex and they can't really be distilled into, um, you know, just a few groups. There's lots of concerns out there. So um, to keep this support going, we're working with our local authority um, partners, voluntary and community sector as well, um, just to support access to the right information and, and verified sources of information for people. Um, we want to make sure that rumours are dispelled and that people understand what the facts are and that the benefits of vaccine. So I'm really pleased to have been invited to, here today to talk to you um, and I'll be here a bit longer so we can answer any questions that come later. Uh, but thank you for listening um, and I'm going to hand back to Councillor Talia again. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Ernie has, has managed to join a call following his um, surgery yet. If I'm waiting to see, has he yes, joined? Yes, I have. Oh, you have, okay. Well then, um, thank you very much, Dr. Jones, and I'll hand over to Dr. Ernie then for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to, um, to speak to you. So I've been asked to talk a bit about the process that you go through um, when having a vaccine, you know, how the appointment's organised, what to expect at the site, uh, and also a bit about what um, to expect when you have the vaccine in terms of how you feel. Um, I'd like to say at the outset that being involved in the vaccination programme has been a, a really positive experience. Um, all of our lives are, are, are very different and we've been affected in different ways over the last year, but we have all been affected. So to be part of a programme that is hopefully going to um, protect the population and, and get us back to the lives that we want to lead is a really wonderful thing to be a part of. So in terms of a bit of background, in November last year, um, GP practices were asked um, to work together to set up centres where we could vaccinate large um, numbers of, of our patients. Uh, and this was very different from the usual way that we run vaccination campaigns like the flu campaign, where we tend to work within our practices with just our practice patients. Um, so this wasn't something we'd done before and, and it took a lot of learning um, and a lot of work to, to get that up and running. Um, different vaccination centres uh, started at different times over December and January and uh, the vaccine centre where I work um, started in January. So actually we were able to use the experience of the sites that had opened um, before us to see what things had worked well and what might need altering when we set up our centre. Um, we were very keen when we um, set up our, our centre and in terms of the planning of it to make sure of a couple of things really. One was obviously the, the safety aspect, to make sure it was really safe for people to come. But the other was that we didn't want people waiting around for long periods when they arrived at the vaccination centre. We wanted a really smooth flow of patients through uh, the vaccine centre when they had their vaccines. Um, the um, reason to do these clinics in a different way from normal, um, there were a few reasons really. One was the, the sheer volume of, of people that we were going to be asked to vaccinate. Um, for most surgeries, running their normal general practice work alongside a large vaccination programme would have been very difficult, so it made sense to, to do things in a different place. And the other was when we first started vaccinating, we were using just the Pfizer vaccine, um, which um, has certain requirements in terms of movement. So trying to move the vaccine as little as possible. And, and because the vaccine was going to large hospital centres to be uh, stored initially and then defrosted before it was moved onto us, that already meant one, um, one bit of movement to get to our centre. So to deliver vaccines to lots of um, smaller centres in GP surgeries would have potentially have, um, made it less effective. So planning to do large numbers of people in one place um, was um, made more sense really. So in terms of thinking about what to expect um, in terms of the vaccine, um, it starts really with the invitation to have the vaccine. Um, and I know that other people on the talk have talked about the um, uh, the priority list. Excuse me if there's any noise in the background. Uh, the vaccination centre is being cleaned at the moment, so I'm sorry about that. Um, 
the what um, we were given is the priority list and, and over the weeks we've been working down through those priority lists and as you know they were based on people at highest risk of becoming seriously ill or, or dying from covid we have really good computer systems in general practice that can um, allow us to search for patients in those various priority groups um, and so we were able then to contact those um, directly to book in for a vaccine. When we first started doing that, we were calling patients um, individually. But as time's gone on, uh, computer systems have, or computer programs have developed so that we're actually able to, um, to send text messages to large numbers of people. And actually people can then book those text messages, uh, book their vaccination appointments through those text messages. But it's really vital that we didn't leave any part of the population um, uh, uncontacted uh, and, and not being offered the vaccine. So again, our computers could tell us um, if people didn't have mobile phones. So we were then calling their landlines to, to book them in or if necessary, sending them letters. We also um, didn't just leave it at a, a one contact for um, each individual patient if they hadn't then booked an appointment. So we would send reminders um, uh, to book an appointment if we hadn't heard from them, or if um, we kept not hearing back from patients, we were then calling them. What we really wanted to make sure was that every patient had the opportunity to talk about the vaccine um, with, with the doctor if they weren't sure whether they wanted it to make sure that they were getting the right information. Um, because actually we, uh, all the, the doctors that you've heard on this call and, and we all know that actually it's, it's the best way of protecting our population. So we were so keen to make sure that everyone was offered that. Um, it's also worth noting that to have your vaccine, you do need an appointment. Um, so vaccine centres aren't running a walk-in. Um, now, do rest assured that your GP practice will contact you when it's your time as they work through the vaccination uh, lists and the priority list, but they will be contacting you. There are um, some patients who, for various reasons, might not be able to get to the vaccination centre. And again, we were really mindful that we didn't want any group within the population left out. So people that were housebound are either being vaccinated by their GP surgeries, arranging visits to, to vaccinate them at home, or um, the way our centre or our local area is running, we have the district nursing team going around to people that are housebound and vaccinating them there. And for people that might find it difficult to get to the vaccination centre that we run, we um, have been in contact with a local charity who will go and collect um, people from their home and bring them to the vaccination centre and then take them back home again to try and make it as, as the, uh, the offer of the vaccine as widespread as possible. Now, each vaccination centre is set up slightly differently, but there are there are uh, common things to all of those vaccination centres. If you could change the slide, please, that'd be great. So our, um, our vaccine centre is actually set up in a, a local scout hut um, and uh, you get a sense of the layout now. It's quite a big area and um, it's well signed in terms of arrows on the floor for, for flows of patients through it. Um, but I'll, I'll talk you through our, how our centre works. So um, when people are booked for a vaccine, they're given a time slot. Um, and as I said earlier, we really wanted to make sure that people weren't then waiting outside for long periods. So um, we sp spent a lot of time thinking about how many people we could vaccinate in an hour and how much staff we would need to ensure a steady flow of people through the vaccine centre. Um, when you arrive at our vaccine centre, and I know lots of centres are like this, there are people outside welcoming you to the centre and um, to keep an eye on any cues that might be developing. And then you're sent inside to the centre and um, logged into the computer record so that we know that people have arrived. Once that's happened, um, you are then sent by one of the uh, volunteers to one of the vaccination stations. If you could show the next slide, please. So each uh, vaccination station is set up in the same way uh, and there is a, a vaccinator who is either a, a pharmacist or a doctor or a nurse uh, and also an administrator. And the um, vaccinator then checks your details to make sure that we got the right person and then um, goes through various questions to ensure that you are eligible and safe to have the vaccine. 
and these are things like um, checking whether you've um, had COVID in the last month, whether you've had any other vaccines in the last week or so, and whether you're well at the moment, um, whether you're pregnant is another one. Um, and we um, also, because we're just doing the first vaccine, we're always checking whether people have actually had the vaccine, but it hasn't gone onto their computer record, so we haven't realised that they've had it as yet. Um, the um, administrator puts all that information onto a computer system that we all use, and then that information about you having the vaccine is transferred to your GP surgery. So your GP surgery sees very quickly that you've had the, the vaccine. Um, the, as I said, we're currently just doing the first vaccines um, and the um, screening that we do, that, that the uh, vaccinator does, that's a way of making sure that you're safe to have the vaccine. There is also a level of screening that's done when you first book the appointment. So if it's over the phone, people will be asking similar sorts of questions if they've booked it over the phone. Um, or if it's booked via the text message link, you're sent some information to check that, that actually you are safe and eligible to have the vaccine. Um, although it's not based at our GP surgery, um, it's run and staffed by members of staff from those local surgeries. So when people come to the vaccine centre, they will often see people that they recognise from their GP surgery. And again, I know that a lot of vaccine centres work in that way. It was really important that we thought about measures to reduce risk of people picking up um, COVID when they were at the vaccine centre. So having a, um, a large group of people coming to one place, it was really important that we had good systems in place to make sure that was done in a safe way. Um, if you could um, show the next slide, please. Um, all staff that work at the vaccine centre wear masks um, and the vaccine centre is set out so that there's social distancing throughout, both when people are waiting outside, that's part of one of the jobs of the uh, volunteer groups, uh, but also when you come into the vaccine centre, we're making sure that people are more than two metres apart and all the vaccine stations are set out so they're more than two metres apart. Um, all patients are encouraged to wear a mask unless there's a, um, a reason that they shouldn't for medical reasons. And um, all the staff are uh, cleaning their hands between each patient with, with hand gel and then washing their hands every few patients. Uh, and if uh, patients have sat down for their vaccination, then all those seats are wiped down. With the, um, the Pfizer vaccine, um, people have to wait 15 minutes afterwards. And again, our centre is laid out so that uh, there is more than two metres space for each person um, or each chair in the, the waiting area at the back of our, our vaccination centre. The reason um, that people have to wait uh, the, the 15 minutes for the Pfizer vaccine was that when um, the national vaccination programme started, um, there were a few incidents of people having severe allergic reactions to the vaccine. Um, actually, as time's gone on, that's very clear that, that that's actually a very rare thing, but we still uh, ask people to wait the 15 minutes afterwards. Um, the, um, so excuse me, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was side effects that people have of the, the vaccine. Uh, and they fall into a few groups really. The most common side effects are things either related to the size of the vaccine. So um, we give the vaccines into the upper arm. Uh, and sometimes people feel some discomfort in the arm for a couple of days afterwards um, and might have a bit of redness around the vaccination site. The other type of side effect that people can get are sort of uh, general symptoms uh, in terms of feeling a bit tired or, or achy or having headaches for a few days afterwards or having a mild fever. Um, really important thing to remember is that um, you can still develop symptoms of, of um, COVID after you've had the vaccine if you've actually been carrying the virus. So sometimes people are feeling well and they come for their, their COVID vaccine, um, but actually after they've had it, develop the symptoms of the infection that was there before they had the, the, um, the vaccine. So it, I think it's worth noting that if you do develop the classical symptoms of coronavirus, so a, a cough or a high fever or a loss of tense, sense of taste or smell or shortness of breath, that um, if that happens within a few days of the vaccine, don't put it down to the vaccine. 
get yourself a, a COVID, vaccine, a COVID test and self-isolate until you know that result. Um, another thing that's important to note, and this may well have been said already today, but you can't get COVID from the vaccine. It doesn't, uh, the vaccines don't contain the live virus. Um, so although you might feel achy, that's because our immune system has been stimulated by the, the vaccine, but it's not that the vaccine has given you COVID. Um, the, um, when you've had the Pfizer vaccine or if you've driven to the vaccine centre and had the AstraZeneca vaccine, as I said earlier, we asked people to wait for 15 minutes. Um, and the, um, once that's happened, once you've waited for 15 minutes, if you're feeling fine, then you can just, just leave. Um, again, different vaccine centres work slightly differently. My father-in-law was given a cup of tea and a biscuit um, after he'd had his vaccine, uh, but I think that's quite rare. We, we certainly don't offer that, I'm afraid. Um, the, um, let me see. If you do get some side effects, um, the, they, they tend to be uh, very mild and um, are, they can be treated by simple medications that you can buy in the chemist. So paracetamol works very well. The vast majority of patients I've spoken to haven't had any side effects that have bothered them to any extent. Um, I had the Pfizer vaccine and had a bit of a, a sore upper arm for a couple of days, but it didn't stop me doing anything and that, that settled. I didn't need any pain relief for that. Um, and as I say, that's been the, um, the, the main sort of reactions that people have had. The feedback that we've had from running the vaccine centre has been lovely, actually. Um, in general, people have been really happy with how smoothly it's run in terms of booking the appointments, but also having their vaccination on the day. And um, have talked about what a, a positive atmosphere it is actually in the vaccine centre. People coming in are generally really happy and relieved to be having the vaccine. You often these, uh, certainly earlier on, these were people who hadn't been outside for a long time on, on in some cases. So actually people are really happy to be protecting themselves and their family, but also do, doing something to help the nation get back to, to, to working normally. Um, again, as I said earlier, we're currently doing first vaccinations and because of that, we're, we're not currently booking people in for their second vaccine. Um, but what we're saying to people is that they will be contacted by their surgery when that second vaccine is due. And we're doing that at, at 11 to 12 weeks at the moment. Some people may know of a small number of people who've actually were invited for their second vaccine in different centres and, and might well have had that second vaccine. And that's because in the centres that started vaccinating early in December, the guidance at that time from government was to do the second vaccine after three to four weeks. Uh, so some people had that second vaccine. Um, in January, that guidance was changed so that um, it's gone to the, the current level of guidance, which is um, have the second vaccine at 12 weeks. Um, I know it can seem a bit disconcerting not to be given a date for the second vaccine, but um, I would really sort of encourage you to, to um, you know, trust that your practice will contact you. We are so keen to make sure that everyone in the population is protected, be able to make sure that people are offered the first vaccine, but when they're due that everyone gets that second vaccine as well. And so um, practices are constantly doing searches of their computer systems to work out when people are due and uh, who's eligible. So it's it's really unlikely that anybody's going to be being missed off on that. Um, patients often ask whether they'll be given the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine when they come for vaccination. Um, at vaccination centres, we're given very short notice uh, as to what vaccine we're going to um, be given at any particular time. So we're not able to tell people in advance what vaccine that they they will get. Um, what I would say is that we know that they're both very effective. I'm sure that's been discussed earlier today. And as more people are vaccinated throughout the country, more data is coming out about how effective the, these vaccines are. Um, going back to um, the concern that people might have been missed off their, their practice list and, and haven't been or haven't been offered a vaccine when they should have. Um, as I said earlier, do have faith in your practices. Um, but if um, another good source of uh, 
um, information actually about uh, which groups of the population are being vaccine, vaccinated is actually the news. The news is, is full of it and the news websites and you'll often get a good idea about what age groups or what um, illness groups are being offered vaccines at any particular time. But if you really feel that you um, have been missed and you're worried about it, just contact your GP practice. They'll be very happy to, to let you know. Uh, but as I say, I, I think you, you can rely on the fact that they are going to invite you when you're due. Um, so, uh, do, excuse me. I think that that's it actually from me. Um, I've run out of pages in my talk there. So uh, thank you for listening. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much, Dr. Ernie. Thank you. Thank thank you. Very, very helpful indeed. Um, we're going to move on to sort of the question and answer section of the evening. I think a, a lot of this, the questions that I've seen so far have, have been answered. Um, but let's let's start to have a little a look through. We had quite a few on on why vaccinate and how how do the vaccines work? And I know Mr. Catillo covered in in detail how a vaccine works and the contents of it. In particular, that there's no animal products in these vaccines. But I wonder around the safety if one of the clinicians um, would like to answer how how safe are the vaccines to receive? How you know how. How many allergic reactions have you seen in Wandsworth or are there any kind of conditions where you absolutely should not be vaccinated? Can you advise people on that? I don't know. Shall I, shall I have a stab at that one then? So, yeah, um, so, um, so I think the first thing to say is that we, we wouldn't offer COVID-19 vaccinations to people um, that weren't deemed safe and have had a lot of scrutiny. So. Um, the, um, the process that they've gone through, I mean, Shannon explained a little of that, but the, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, isn't that lovely, MHRA. So this is the official UK regulator um, that wasn't set up to deal with COVID vaccines. This is how all of our medicines are uh, assessed to be, to be safe. Um, and they said that these vaccines have an excellent safety profiles um, and offer a high level of protection. So um, we've, clinicians have you know, really good confidence high in, in, um, in this and, and in the MHRA processes and their judgment. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, there are checks at every stage in the development and manufacturing process. And one thing that this whole thing has taught us is about how to go through those processes more rapidly when it's needed. And this will help us for decades to come. So it's been um, really ex extraordinary. And we don't think corners have been cut to do this. It's just that we learned how to do these processes more rapidly. So um, it feels that, this, that it feels and seems that the vaccines are safe. Um, however, of course, you people get effects from vaccines, um, and and um, Karen was describing the you know the sore arm um, and people who might feel you know slightly slightly unwell, um, maybe as if you're coming down with something, and you know might need to have an early night and you know take a paracetamol and that kind of thing. And these are very common reactions: headache, bit of fatigue, um, sometimes some chills and body aches. So those are common things, but these aren't safety issues that you know lots of vaccines have these effects like the flu vaccine for example very commonly does and people are aware of that and come back for it year after year um so um so the allergy aspect of that is is um it, but it's still evolving the understanding of this um um, but you can have the vaccine um, if you have allergies in most circumstances. But there are a few people um, that we need to make sure that we are cautious about. Um, but if you have asthma and that's all you have, then um, you can have the vaccine. If you're allergic to something that you know about, if it's penicillin or nuts or some other kind of food, um, and you're aware of what the trigger is for your allergy, then you can have the vaccine because it doesn't have any of those constituents. Um, and, and Shannon showed a, a slide, didn't he, of, of the different constituents of the vaccine. There is one constituent in the vaccine called um, PEG. Um, oh, I can, I can never remember what it's called, polyethanyl glycol or something like that. We call it PEG. It's really rare to be allergic to this. Um, but it does, it is in lots of different medicines um, and preparations. And so people that 
have this allergy tend to be allergic to lots of different things and they're usually well aware of that and may have been tested for it. So when we find someone who is allergic to lots of things and we're not quite sure about it, then we take extra care and ask the right questions um, and might even think about not having the vaccine right then until we've done a little bit more exploration and understood what's going on. And um, so if you're worried, I mean, you need to check with your doctor. I've seen some of the questions um, uh, that have been put in in the chat there about this. Um, but your doctor, your GP understands your medical history and your health. And so they really are the person to check with just to make sure of specific issues. Um, so everyone is asked questions when they present for the vaccine about these things. But if it looks complicated, then we have to take extra measures just to be careful. But I think it's safe to say that there have been very few reactions. So of my 30,000 patients in my population, I've vaccinated five and a half thousand already. And um, we've had one case where someone had a, some redness around the arm area, in addition to the usual aching. Um, and that's just um, you know, interesting. And we report it through the right medicine system. So this information is being gathered centrally. So we get to understand more about the vaccines. Um, but it's been really quite minor stuff. And um, very important to say there have been no deaths as a consequence of the vaccine. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Jones. That was very thorough. Thank you. Um, I also wanted, there's been quite a few on efficacy um, and sort of the issue around no vaccine gives you 100% um, cover. So I think that's one aspect. It's maybe one for you, Mr. Cotillo, but also the issue of the um, emerging strains of the of the coronavirus itself. You know, there's sort of some people are saying, well, what's the point? Will a new strain mean that it doesn't make any difference? Or would, would that be a clinical question or a public health question? I think. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm happy to uh, start on a response, and uh, obviously uh, Nicola and, and and Kieran could could add to that. So large trials have shown that the Pfizer vaccine, for example, was 95% effective, uh, and then that the Oxford vaccine uh, after two doses was up to 82% effective. But I think the main take home message is that all the vaccines that have been licensed for use in the UK are on the basis of them being safe and being effective. So they are all highly effective. And even if um, you know not uh, vaccines are not 100 percent effective, they, the, the ones that we have licensed have all got high levels of uh, of effectiveness. So I think that's that's the first thing. Um, and, and, and also just uh, obviously as uh, more people have had the vaccine, I mentioned that we've had uh, what is called the SIREN study conducted by Public Health England, which is actually starting to show us that in real world conditions, so outside of trials, the vaccines are demonstrating that high level of effectiveness in terms of preventing severe illness, um, and, and also uh, potentially starting to uh, reduce the, the number of people who will um, have uh, poor outcomes and potentially die from, um, from, from the virus. And then in terms of the, uh, of the new, new variants, I think scientists and researchers are still trying to understand uh, what the impact is of the vaccines that we currently have available on the variants. So what we now know though is uh, scientists and researchers are quite quickly able to change uh, or alter the vaccines if they need to uh, in order to account for these new variants just because of all the sort of rapid progression that has taken place with the technology and all the collaboration I think scientists are confident that if they do need to make some changes uh, then then they'll be able to do so and we know for example that uh, the flu vaccine on a year by year basis sometimes needs to be changed because viruses mutate all the time and some of it is about understanding the nature of the changes that have taken place in the virus and uh, working out, for instance, does it lead to more rapid transmission? Does it lead to more serious illness? Does it increase the risk of death? And researchers are looking at this all the time. Thank you very much. Was, that, was there anything else you want to share? Uh, I just 
that was that was very comprehensive, Sharon. Shannon, I just wanted to add, I suppose that in comparison to the flu vaccine, um, these the levels of protection you get from this virus are really excellent. Um, and you know, um, the flu vaccine is somewhere around forty to sixty percent, isn't it, depending on on the year. Um, so these are excellent levels of protection, and we know that having the first dose gives you quite significant protection and the second dose reinforces it and of course we don't know as much about what happens beyond the second dose because not so many people have had it yet but that will be very much studied later but the evidence coming out now is is um, you know really really reassuring. That's great to hear and actually it's a really interesting point I guess the, the flu vaccine is one that does cover multiple strains and, and does it change annually am I right in thinking that it's quite a sort of a common a common thing for vaccines okay so we're moving moving on then to uh, there's been quite a few questions around and I know no one can answer yet on vaccine passports what's it going to look like but I, I, I wonder if uh, Mr Katia if you can if you can sort of address can people be forced to be vaccinated? Can you know? Can they get exemption letters, um, or it, are there situations where people are being forced to prove that they've had the vaccine that you're aware of for employment purposes? Is there what's the, is there any legislation around that at the moment? So currently, vaccines are only offered to people on the basis of informed consent, and this means that people uh, need to have had the information to understand um, what the potential benefits of the vi uh, vaccine are, what the side effects might be, how the vaccine works, uh, and then obviously them being able to to understand all that information to to make a decision. So people are not coerced into taking the vaccine. And I think that's why it's really important that uh, we're doing a lot of this work in terms of uh, engaging with people and trying to explain uh, what what the facts are, as well as being very transparent about, uh, you know, any potential risks or side effects so that people are able to make those decisions for themselves. Thank you for that. And would it be possible, I wonder if one of the um, clinicians can answer, if, if you have concerns about it, you can make an appointment to see your GP and they'd be able to advise you or have that conversation in advance of booking in. Is, is that something you would be experienced and happy to, to do, Dr. Ernie? Yes, absolutely. Um, we're really keen, as I said earlier, to um, make sure that people have got good quality information and, and that are reassured. Um, so no, we're always happy to chat to patients about it. And uh, different GP practices have different ways of managing that. My practice has a, a list of um, queries that have come in and we call back patients individually. So yeah, very keen to do that. Great, thank, thank you. And I think hopefully for people that have put in specific medical questions, they'll be able to speak to their own GPs because I, I understand having access to the full case history is important to help you make those informed choices. In terms of then moving on to sort of the prioritisation of, of the list, um, I know there's a lot, there's a lot of sort of um, news between different groups of friends and people who are in different practices who, who may think that someone that's younger than them or they think should be in a different priority group has been already offered and already vaccinated and, and they haven't. So I wondered if, if you can address how how it's prioritised at, at the moment and um, and whereabouts we are sort of in those priority groups and what people can do if they think that they have been missed out. So I guess there are people, for example, that might be an, in, a carer for, for a loved one informally who perhaps the GP surgery wouldn't be aware of that necessarily. So is there some way that people can speak to their, their GPs about which priority group they're in and, and sort of speak about how, how they, which group they think they should be in and why? So I don't know if that's for Mr Cotillo or, or Dr Jones in the first instance. So do you want, do you want me to take it? So, I, um, so I think, so as I said, I think with the first four priority groups, um, it's relatively straightforward because they're um, largely based on age or for health and care professionals. And those people know who they are because their employer will have um, offered to um, you know, um, put their names on lists where they could be invited. Um, it gets more complicated as soon as you get out of the age um, criteria, of course, which is why the national 
call off list is only based on age because they can't um, get access to the information about individual people's health in the way that the GP record is holding it. So if you're in the clinically extremely vulnerable or the shielding list or you're in the under 65 group of people which who are deemed to be moderately at risk, um, then if you're in that first group, you should know about it because you'll know if you're on the shielding list by now. So if you think you should be in the shielding list, but you're not, then that's one thing we would want to make sure that you contacted your GP about. Um, if you are in the under 65 list um, and either you think you shouldn't be or you, um, you're not, or you're not being called yet um, and you think you should be, then it, it gets a bit more complicated because actually there's quite a lot of people in this group and we're only a little way through calling them in. So it's perfectly possible that you just haven't been called in yet. Um, and if your practice is, is running from quite a small site with small population, they may have got though through that cohort more quickly than a bigger site, which is looking after patients from a, a wider population. So there might be a disparity in any one day um, with, you know, um, with people, neighbours who are at different GP practices who, um, you know, have relatively similar issues, but one's been called in and not the other. That will all even out really quickly um, because we're expecting in Wandsworth to get through this cohort very soon. I mean, over the course of the next two weeks. So we're, you know, we're talking about them a matter of, of days or weeks difference in, in when people are vaccinated. Um, I think there's, there's one concerning thing for people is when they're in that risk group and they don't know why. And we are getting a lot of calls in GP practices about that. Um, actually, it's taking up an awful lot of time. But, you know, we recognise that people are concerned. It's probably best to see if your GP has a messaging system on their website. Um, uh, some kind of emailing system just to put your query in because you know we wouldn't want to block up phone lines for people who are trying to get access to you know GPs or nurses on the day for example so think about whether your query uh, could be handled in, in an email system it also frankly gives the GP time to look at what the issues are and sometimes it's a bit difficult to work out where some people have been called because it it could be something that happened to you in the past that you've recovered from forgotten about but it does give you that measure of additional risk that needs to be taken into account. Um, and some people are found up because they've been called in, they were really rather unexpe unexpectedly called in. Um, and some people are coming because they feel quite guilty about the fact that they've been called in before other people. And so we have that conversation too. Um, and sometimes it's justified. And sometimes in fact, it's something quirky and in a medical record that um, actually probably shouldn't be addressed in exactly that way. And that's helpful to sort out. Um, but I, I do, I, you know, I would encourage people, of course, we want people's concerns to be addressed, but um, it, it might get quite overwhelming for general practice if people all start calling up. So think about the best way to contact your GP. If you can do it online, we would very much appreciate that. Thank, thank you very much um, for that. Um, we, we also have had quite a few questions. We're almost out of time, but I'll just try and um, if you can address sort of um, people who might have additional sensory needs when they're coming for the vaccine or a learning disability. Are there any special sort of um, things that you are doing to accommodate those those people? Yeah, Kieran, Kieran might have some specific examples actually, but I've, I've, um, we, we, I know that there's um, various approaches being, being taken. Um, so we do want to make sure that people with learning um, disabilities um, are called because they are in a, a higher risk, at higher risk of having a poor outcome from COVID if they get it. So we do want to protect people and their carers. Um, so um, people should, if they're on the register in their GP practice, if their GP practice is aware of their learning disability, and for most people that's the case, then they will be being called in. Um, but it's um, it, it's sometimes important to assess on an individual basis how people could best access the vaccine. We've had people who've called who, you know, we wouldn't normally do a home visit for, but actually it's better if they're in their own home being vaccinated. And, and practices have been very receptive to that. And I know we've visited people who technically aren't housebound, but it would just be better to do the vaccine at home. So there's a lot of that kind of thing going on, um, which I think is really important. And there's also one um, Battersea initiative where um, GPs are going into um, some um, accommodation, some supported accommodation, so they can vaccinate all the residents at once. 
um, if they want to be vaccinated. Um, and that's great because they're in their own environment where it's familiar and it's much more likely to be um, uh, acceptable to them. So um, various things going on there. Um, there's some um, work going on with um, supporting people, for example, that those who are, are blind and there's work with the London Vision and Sight Loss Council um, to reach out to those communities and, and provide the right materials to inform people, because I think that's one of the things is um, people might be quite willing to have the vaccine or unwilling to have the vaccine, but they may not have had access to the right information about it either way. You know, we wouldn't want people to come forward um, just to have the vaccine without understanding what's what's going on. I think that's really important as well. So we need we all want to make reasonable adjustments for people and make sure it's all accessible for them. Great, thank you very much. I see that there's an another question that's come in um, and essentially give it the, what they're asking is given that originally you were meant to have the second dose three weeks after the first and that's what it was originally licensed for. Are you sure that the overall effectiveness of the vaccine remains unaffected if you have it after 12 weeks? So has changing the dosage space made it less effective is the question, I think. I don't know who wants to take that. Is um, so, Shannon, I don't know if you've got evidence at your fingertips um, on, on this, but I think that so for the AstraZeneca vaccine, actually, it's better to have it later. What we know is um, that actually the licensing originally was for 28 days and up to 12 weeks, and the efficacy seems to be better if it's approaching 12 weeks rather than earlier. So that's that's a win. The Pfizer vaccine was um, originally meant to be at three weeks um, and it's thought that. And so you know, it, it's not fully proven yet, but the, the, the information coming out seems to indicate that, yes, the efficacy with the second dose will be still at a very high level. I mean, this is a very efficacious vaccine. Um, so that's that's looking like it's the right thing. And if you think about what that was meant to achieve, um, I call it the grandparent effect. So we had so many vaccines. If you have um, one vaccine, um, if you have two vaccines and two, va two grandparents, what would you rather do? Give both vaccines to one grandparent or give one vaccine to each grandparent? And what are you likely to achieve from that? And when you put it in those terms, I think lots of people would say, well, actually, if you get some protection, that's better than none. And we should do that. So that was what that was all about. Um, but it luckily doesn't, well, not luckily, I think it was anticipated that it wouldn't have a hugely detrimental effect on the overall efficacy. But, you know, this stuff is, is it is all still emerging. Thank you. Mr. Katia, did you want to add anything? No, I think uh, Nicola explained that beautifully. I can't add anything to that. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. Well, thank you very much. I, I think we're out of we're out of time now um, in terms of questions. There are other um, questions that have been submitted, and I'm sorry that we haven't managed to get round to them. Um, but what will happen now is that the team will go through the Q and A um, and make sure we get an answer to every one of of your questions, and they will appear on the website. I also hope that you managed to complete the quiz that was shared with you this evening. Um, if not, we'll share it again and we'll be keen to know your responses to it. In addition to the quiz, we would also ask you, please, if you could complete the evaluation of the event. And a link is now going to be in the Q&A tab for you to click on. And if you can complete this, it just gives us a little bit more information about what sort of things you need from us to help you make an informed choice on the vaccine. I'd like to say many thanks to Manuel Button from Wandsworth Community Transport, who's joined our audience this evening. Uh, the service that his team are providing includes sort of the free transport to and from vaccine centres for residents with mobility issues. They can take wheel a wheelchair or provide one if you need it. So it's, it's an amazing service and thank you very much for providing it. If anyone needs to know any more about it, there are details in the Q&A link in how you can get in touch with Wandsworth Community Transport and Manuel's team to book in to utilise this. So tonight you've listened to the views of health professionals. I hope you've gained some reassurance and some more information that are going to help you to make the right choice on the vaccine. We're going to have a further event on Saturday the 20th of March, which will invite people to submit their questions about the vaccine to a panel of informed local leaders. We'll share some more information about that with you nearer the time, and I hope that you can join us then and perhaps ask anyone you know who's yet to make up their own mind about the vaccine if they would like to come and take part. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. 
A big thank you to all of our presenters, Mr. Cotillo, Dr. Jones and Dr. Ernie. Thank you very much for taking time out to come and talk to people and explain um, the, the importance of, the, of taking the coronavirus vaccine. Um, thank you also to the team behind the scenes who have been keeping us all to time and helping troubleshoot all the tech issues. Please remember, tell us any existing um, additional concerns that you have through the Q&A function and we will respond to them and they'll come up on the FAQ section of the website along with a recording of this event if you want to watch again. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening.